All right. Well, uh, we have a special special guest this morning for NB Heart Center CV Weekly Rounds, uh, Dr. Mark Pelche, uh, who uh, was the uh, chief of the uh, Department of Cardiac Surgery here in uh, St. John at the Heart Center between 2007 and 2016. Uh, Mark's originally from Edmonston, as many of you remember, um, he uh, went to Mount A, did his med at Dell, uh, did his cardiac surgery residency in, in Montreal at McGill, which is where I met him as a medical student, uh, and uh, was uh, fortunate to have uh, had that encounter, obviously, because I ended up coming and joining him at the Heart Center. From there on, he went to Stanford to do a fellowship, uh, started at Sunnybrook, uh, and then went on to Stanford before coming uh, here uh, up until 2016, and more recently has, uh, has traveled back into the U.S. and is currently uh, in, in Cleveland uh, at uh, the University Hospital System, uh, Case Western uh, Reserve, and uh, he's uh, chief of the program there. And um, you know, it's almost five years to the date that you drove down. I actually it came up as a memory yesterday on my phone, pictures <laughs> from your going away thing um, at the Shadow Lawn. And I think you literally drove that night to go into Boston uh, because you, you were starting the next morning, you had meetings and whatnot. So it's uh, kind of ironic uh, that that actually popped up on my phone last night. And uh, it's really nice to have you after five years, I think uh, long overdue and uh, welcome back. Well, thanks, Ansar. Um, thanks very much for the nice introduction. And it's really nice to be back. In fact, I, I was scrolling through some of the names and faces and uh, just to see, you know, Craig, uh, good morning. Nice to see you, Craig Brown again. And um, just so many, uh, so many people that I see the, the names and a lot of them are, I don't see the faces right now, but Peter, I see your face. So great to see you. And um, it's really nice. And in fact, it was kind of a nice stroll down memory lane for me to prepare a little bit for this talk. I was going to Keep it really light at your suggestion, Ansar, and just really talk about some of the reflections that we've had. Bonjour, uh, Rino, comment ça va? And then um, just kind of keep it uh, fairly light and, and maybe share with you some observation and things that I'm really proud about, and, and especially now when I hear about how the Heart Center is doing and, and has thrived, um, and maybe share with you a little bit of what I'm doing now. Um, so, um, this is where uh, I arrived, so beautiful campus. And in fact, I've given many talks since I've left uh, showing this picture, because it really is quite a, a beautiful picture uh, showing the Heart Center and, and the university and everything that uh, New Brunswick has to offer. And you're right, Ansar, it's quite a long time ago. And these were my boys around the time that we were thinking about coming uh, back to Canada. Uh, and then in fact, uh, I remember when we put the four boys and the dog in a Thule roof rack on the minivan and drove all the way from uh, Stanford to St. John so that I could start my job and uh, lo and behold I didn't realize it at the time but I drove right through two cities I drove right through Cleveland which I had never been before and I drove right through Boston on our way to uh, New Brunswick but I, I didn't know at the time that they would feature as my life went on uh, but this is what our family looked like in 2007 when we moved to uh, to Canada and we moved really to New Brunswick which was the best move I could have made it really allowed me to spend a lot of time with my family to have a great uh, start of my career uh, and this is what they look like now so they're all getting bigger and uh, older and the three are all in university now one's at Mount A one's at Dal and one's at McGill and our little guy is uh, still with us so times change but uh, all for the good and then I found this photo as well of my colleagues when I joined uh, the New Brunswick Heart Center and Jim Parrott had been instrumental in helping me to make that decision to go there. And I was really fortunate to join two really outstanding colleagues, Rand Forgey and Craig Brown. And uh, with that really was the start of my tenure there uh, at the Heart Center. Uh, when I arrived, it was in 2007. So it was in August of 2007. And the Heart Center had started around the early 90s and had been uh, very steady, around 550 to 660 cases or so for several years. Uh, but we had acquired a fairly large wait list, which I think has been a chronic problem that's plagued the heart center. Uh, but within that first year, we were able to increase volume. I was looking back at my notes, and when I interviewed at the heart center in 2007, uh, there were a few things that I had listed that we wanted to try to establish at the heart center. And it's funny looking back at this list of things now, because uh, there were a lot of things that were not really being done at the time or not being done very much. Uh, but there were things that I, I felt that were important for patient care and the endoscopic vein harvesting system like our colleagues were doing in Halifax, multi-arterial grafting. Uh, with ANSAR's arrival, we were able to start a minimally invasive uh, program 
And also with your arrival, Ansar, to start a clinical outcomes research program that has grown to be very successful. At the time, it was very much uh, incumbent upon us to improve the delivery of, of French uh, services at the New Brunswick Heart Center. And really, the, the Heart Center has done an amazing job in, in, in that aspect. Another one was to repatriate patients. We were having approximately 220 patients a year having surgery outside of New Brunswick at that time, uh, and that has changed a lot. And some of it also was related to intraoperative uh, uh, imaging. I was able to find a few uh, really nice snapshots of, of the team. Uh, and I always joke about this picture because, you know, how many perfusionists does it take to, to run a heart lung machine? Um, but the perfusion group, as I've always said there, was just second to none and an unbelievable group of people, uh, extremely good. Uh, I, I would say that one of the biggest differences I've seen in the American and the Canadian healthcare system uh, is, is how good Canadian physicians are across the board. There really are no weak or poor physicians in Canada. There are very few of them. And in the States, that disparity is all over the place. And um, the interventional group, when I started there, was, was just fantastic, uh, led by these five individuals. Uh, the clinical cardiology group, uh, also uh, just amazing. Um, and poor Satish at the time was alone. I think he has some help now, but uh, at the time, Satish was a one-man show and uh, going at it like crazy uh, every day. Um, within a couple of years, um, we had, first of all, had a locum with Dan Wong, and then we were fortunate to be able to hire uh, you, Ansar. Um, and really, with, from that 2007 to 2009 period of time, we were able to increase our volume and to increase the complexity of some of the cases uh, that we were doing. Uh, but again, you'll see maybe a recurrent theme, even one that we talked about earlier, was always this feeling that we were a little bit under-resourced in terms of being able to, to really do everything that, that we needed to do. Um, of course, as, as a surgeon, you're only part of the team, um, the, the team that we had in terms of our advanced care providers, uh, our APPs there was tremendous. But just to put this into perspective, um, we have four or five of those individuals for a volume of about eight to 900 at the New Brunswick Heart Center, where I'm currently, uh, we have a volume of about 1400, so it's a little bit bigger, um, but we have a total of approximately 16 to 17 uh, APPs that function in that role. Uh, in addition to that, we have approximately 16 currently first assistants in the operating room, and a total of about 17 perfusionists. So it, that, that theme of resource is really one in which, uh, looking back on it, it's really amazing the amount of work that the Heart Center is able to do uh, with, with the resources that it, that it has. Uh, and then just a bit of a stroll down memory lane, uh, our, our perfusion group. Uh, this is probably during an off-pump procedure here. Ron is reading a little bit of the newspaper. Uh, David Hughes in the corner. And again, uh, just some tremendous individuals. So over time, um, from 2007 to when I left in 16, we saw the surgical volumes rise. In 2010, uh, we did the first TAVIs, which uh, we did nine that year. So if you can imagine, that was really the, the start of something big. And at the time, we were the first site east of Quebec uh, doing TAVIs. Now our colleagues in Halifax are, are doing them as well. And I understand this, this program has continued to grow as it has across most centers. Um, there are many accomplishments that I'm really happy about that I was part of. Uh, one was endoscopic vein harvesting, and that may not sound like such a big deal now, but at the time it was really, um, really a big deal. One, to get the technology into the hospital because the cost per, per case was substantial. Number two, to be able to train the individuals and um, the surgical assistants, um, Mike Chapman, Steve Smith, Greg Clark, Mortiza Del Varkin, uh, the ability for those people to take this on and to do it as well as they have. But in, for us, it may not be a big deal, but in the lives of patients, this is a really big deal. And I, I still think is one of the biggest advancements in cardiac surgery in the last 30 years. Uh, the development of the TAVI program is also something I was tremendously happy to be part of. Um, and, and I remember those days working with Vern and Brian and Darren and, and Rand, and, um, and perhaps one of the most important people of that on that team was Heather LeBlanc to follow up all these patients. But to develop this type of program for what it's done to patients. Again, I think this is one of the biggest advancements that we've had uh, in cardiac surgery. And the volume at, at the New Brunswick Heart Center is really symbolic, I think, of what we've seen across North America, which now the TAVI volume has surpassed the standard aortic valve uh, volume considerably. And I think that will continue as the years go on, as the devices get a little bit better. 
Uh, and with that, we've seen just tremendous outcomes with 30-day mortalities that are now around 2% for TAVI patients. And that's also symbolic of the fact that we're now doing lower risk and, and more moderate risk patients. And one of the other developments that I was really proud to be part of and that had a lot to do with your recruitment, Ansar, was the development of minimally invasive surgery, especially as it relates to minimally invasive mitral valve surgery and minimally invasive coronary bypass surgery. And again, now, if you look in the United States and North America, only about 15 to 20 percent of mitral valve surgeries are done through a minimally invasive approach. So the fact that at the New Brunswick Heart Center, we were doing that back in 2012 or so uh, is really a testament to, to the skill and ability to do that. Um, and here you see those patients, which you're, you're doing well. But perhaps one of the things I was most happy about during my time there was um, the development of the New Brunswick Heart Center into what I would say is a nationally recognized program. Uh, and that, you know, with Jean-Francois being president of the CSCS, and you have a big leadership role coming up as well, Ansar, uh, I was able to participate with the Royal College uh, at the exam board level. And really those things, when you go to the CCC now, or you speak in Canada, uh, the New Brunswick Heart Center is a really well-respected uh, entity, both in terms of its clinical outcomes and, and its research. Uh, but during that time with your arrival, Ansar, really is when the Clinical Outcomes Research Program blossomed. Um, with Craig, there was a tremendous clinical trials program, and, and Craig Brown, I think, has continued that. But the Clinical Outcomes uh, Research Program really increased. We were fortunate as well that Dalhousie formed its medical school, the St. John campus, during that time. And, and the link with Keith Brunt and that team in terms of research has been tremendous in terms of publications and again, presenting at international meetings and, and major publications. And the other thing when I look about back on it now is the telehealth program and how far advanced it was. I mean, now virtual visits and Zoom meetings and virtual consults are, are normal, but at the time to see somebody on a on telehealth follow-up visit was really, was really interesting. So I pulled up this slide, which was, uh, I think, within a few months of when I left, and this was a, a big meeting that we'd had with a Horizon, uh, and this was kind of a summary of, of where we had gone. And it's interesting that this is a, a recurring theme really at the New Brunswick Heart Center, which was our formal request to Horizon to really increase that volume. And here you see a little bit of a timeline uh, of all the surgeries that had been previously exported to Nova Scotia and to Quebec, the surgeries repatriated. Uh, we increased when I arrived, it was at 14 cases a week, uh, just going to 16 was a challenge, but we were able to do that. Subsequently, the wait list improved then grew longer again. Then in 2014, we went up to 18 cases a week and the wait list continued uh, to, to go there. And I, I have to say, if I remember my last year or two at the Heart Center, this was probably my biggest area of stress or anxiety was the wait list that we had and the number of patients that we had uh, waiting. And more importantly is how long they were waiting. So in order to get 90% of our patients in, 90% um, of our patients, it was taking over 150 days. So if you think about it, that's, that's an eternity. I can tell you that in my current life, either in Boston or Cleveland, if I told somebody that they would wait even one month or two months for cardiac surgery, uh, they would quickly go somewhere else and I, I would lose them as a patient. So it's, it's a very interesting philosophy and, and way of, of acceptance. And, and this was one of the last slides in terms of recommendations that we had for Horizon. <laughs> And uh, it, it'd be interesting answer to see how many of these have actually um, taken shape. But you know, the mm. one of them was to increase the number of surgeons from four to five, and I, I, I do believe that has happened. The other was to provide uh, existing services or increased services to anesthesiology and, and perfusion and OR nursing. But again, all related to to resources. Yeah. And and I think one of the things in life that I've learned is that when you invest in human resources and, and when you invest in humans. Uh, you, you can never go wrong by, by doing that, that that investment is usually worth its weight in gold. Um, so in 2016 or so, um, I, I did miss some of the academia in the United States, and I had been at the New Brunswick Heart Center uh, for almost 10 years, and I had a chance to get back into the American system. Um, so we'll transition a little bit to what I've been doing over the last uh, few minutes, but what I've been doing over the, the last few years uh, so I was recruited to go uh, to Harvard Medical School and to Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, and I felt that that was just a challenge that I, I couldn't say no to. So this is a picture uh, of Harvard Medical School. And right behind Harvard, right behind this building, uh, is, is the, um, this building, which is where my office was here in this right wing, which is the original Brigham uh, 
building. Um, so that was when uh, we decided to go a little bit south. So went from St. John uh, down to Boston, stayed in Boston for a few years until I had this opportunity uh, as chief of cardiac surgery at, at Case Western. Um, and this is just going back to Brigham, you know, as opposed to that beautiful picture that I showed you of uh, the New Brunswick Heart Center and all the greenery in the water. Uh, this is the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So the, the pictures that you see here in color are all the different university buildings. So here's the medical school that I was showing you. And right at the back of that medical school is the original Brigham Hospital. Uh, but all these are different buildings. And this is the cardiovascular building at Brigham. So this whole building is entirely cardiovascular. The top six floors are all patient uh, floors. Every single room is an individual room where the patient's families can stay. Even in the ICU, they can stay overnight. Uh, and in the basement, actually, is where the operating rooms and the cath labs are located. Uh, and this is the Shapiro building uh, at night, a uh, beautiful building. And perhaps one of the best things about living in Boston at the Brigham was uh, about five or six blocks away was Fenway Park. So at the end of the day of, of working, the games would usually start about 7, 7.15. So I'd walk over to Fenway and, and uh, grab a ticket and go see the Red Sox. Um, so in, in um, 2019 or so, after being in Boston for about three years or three, three and a half years, uh, I was recruited to look at a job in Cleveland. And I remember getting on a plane that night and my wife said, where are you going? And I said, I'm, I'm going to look at a job in Cleveland, but don't worry, there's no way in hell I'm taking a job in Cleveland. And uh, she laughed and she said, good, good, have fun. But uh, what I found here was actually an incredible organization. Um, they were looking for a chief of cardiac surgery, an organization that was growing uh, across multiple uh, hospitals. So uh, this is our hospital, and and currently I'm I'm over a bit right of this. This is a parking garage. This is the cancer institute, and our operating rooms are all here on the second floor. Um, and this is one of approximately 18 to 19 hospitals in the university hospital system, which is adjacent to Case Western. So Case Western is one of the major academic institutions in the United States. Uh, last year was ranked 21st in the United States in terms of academia. Uh, and Cle Cleveland, despite uh, some bad raps in the past, is actually a beautiful city. It has the largest uh, number of musicals and Broadway plays anywhere in North America, except for New York has the best symphony of anywhere in North America uh, and beautiful museums that are actually free of charge uh, and beautiful places to live. So and I, direct, um, I direct cardiac surgery at the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, the, heart, the HVI here takes in approximately $1.9 billion in revenue on a yearly basis. University Hospitals does approximately $5 billion of business on a yearly basis. So just to put that into perspective, the healthcare budget in New Brunswick is approximately $4 billion. Uh, but again, the American and Canadian systems are, are quite different and inflated. Um, one of the reasons I came is that my department chair is Joe Sabic, And Joe was previously chief of cardiac surgery at the Cleveland Clinic and will be incoming uh, president of the STS in a couple of years. Uh, and he was one of the major reasons that I, I chose to take this job. Uh, but I'm very lucky to have a tremendously talented group that's a very multicultural and international group. Uh, Joe and Alan would be two of the only Americans. Uh, here we have a Chilean, a Russian, an Englishman. Uh, Yasser, we recruited last year. He was chief of, at Papworth Hospital in Cambridge, chief of transplant there. So we were able to recruit Yasser uh, here. Um, Pablo is from Argentina. Greg is another American. Omar is from Libya. So a tremendously talented group. Just to give you a little bit of a, a perspective of what we do. So the, the centers that are here in green are Cleveland Clinic centers, which is obviously our biggest competitor in the area. The ones in red are uh, university hospital sites that we do cardiac surgery. And last a couple months ago, um, university hospitals acquired Lake West system uh, for approximately $500 million. They bought these three hospitals that are associated with Lake West. So we now operate at uh, six different hospitals across the system. Uh, this has been the volume growth at our center over the last uh, 10 years. So it's a, a fairly rapidly growing center. We do approximately 400 TAVI uh, cases a year, uh, in addition to the 12 to 1300 uh, open heart cases that are done uh, each year. But as you'll see in terms of efficiency, this pales in comparison to the heart center. You'll see that here, many of the centers are doing 50, 60, 160 cases a year. Uh, so the way that we do that is that we view 
all these centers as being the same. So the operating rooms are at different locations, but everything about those operating rooms, all the supplies, the perfusionists are the same. They go from center to center. The first assistants are the same. They go from center to center. Uh, and that's how we're able to do it. Uh, we have lots of areas of expertise here. So we have a relatively robust uh, heart transplant program that did 23 heart transplants last year. Uh, we do about 40 to 50 VADs uh, a year. We have a fairly busy aortic uh, surgery program. Uh, this center offers free calcium scoring CT scans. So over the last 10 years, there are approximately 4,500 CT scans that we've been able to tap into. And out of that found over 500 CT scans with ascending aortas of greater than 4.5 centimeters. So uh, we're tapping into that. Uh, arterial grafting program is quite big here. It's very common to get skeletonized bilateral mammaries uh, and endoscopic radial arteries. We have approximately nine to 10 first assistants who can take a radial artery uh, endoscopically. Um, complex cardiac surgery, I, I put that there because we get a lot of cases referred from different states or smaller hospitals that don't wanna take on these cases. So we only approximately 30% of our of our volume is coronary bypass surgery. The rest is, is a lot of different things. Uh, lastly, um, before we go on to some questions, I, you know, I don't think you can present anything these days without talking a little bit about COVID um, and the situations of how Canada and the US have handled COVID are, are starkly different. Um, but this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of what we've had to deal with. So this is our, our actually our hospital system, um, our hospital system starting back in March and April last year. And what you see in blue are, is the daily census. So how many patients are, are in hospital? So we peaked uh, around right after the American Thanksgiving um, <clears throat> at about 290 patients. And then you saw, saw that that peak kind of came down. So these are patients in hospital. The orange bars are the patients that are actually in the ICU. So again, our peak for the ICU was around the 1st of December. Uh, and at that peak of the ICU, we had approximately 90 patients uh, in the ICU at any given time. Uh, and approximately half of those always being intubated. We've done about uh, 22, 23 uh, COVID ECMO patients. So we cannulate them fem fem and put them on ECMO. Uh, of those, we've only had four or five survive and not, not surviving with tremendous quality of life at all. So. Uh, it's a terrible disease. I think what we're seeing here is a little bit of a fourth wave that people are talking about. I think that will be attenuated by the vaccination that's going on in the United States right now. Lot, yesterday, there were over 4 million people vaccinated in the U.S. So uh, the vaccination attempts here are, are going really at a, a nice pace right now. Uh, most of us, everybody I work with has all been vaccinated now for several months. And in the state of Ohio, despite having a Republican governor, it's been actually a very progressive state and vaccination is now open to everybody above the age of 16. So anybody above the age of 16 now can get vaccinated. Um, and that's where we are. So final thoughts. Um, the Heart Center, I, I think is really, well, I don't think, I know it's an unbelievable place. And my time there uh, is, is nine to 10 years of the best years of my life. The Heart Center provides tremendous, tremendous value. When you look at the number of cases that are done, the wasted time slots, all that is, the wastage is extremely low. What you are able to do at the Heart Center with the resources that you have is really uh, incredible and incredibly uh, efficient. I, I, would, I would suggest or really promote you to try to keep your foot on the pedal and continue to innovate. It is a bit difficult in the Canadian system because again, it costs money and resources are involved. But I can tell you in the next five to 10 years, transcatheter mitral valve replacements will become something that is quite common. Ventricular cyst devices will become much more common, especially as we are very close to solving now the energy transfer source so that we don't have a drive line exiting the patients. Um, those are already uh, in, in demo. And once they become mainstream uh, VADs for people with end stage heart failure, I think, I'm not sure they'll replace transplants, but they, they will have an increasing role. So I think if I know that's something you're thinking about and I would encourage you to continue in that direction. Robotic surgery, I'm not sure, offers a whole lot over minimally invasive other than visualization, but uh, it is in increasing, increasingly being used and it's something even for us that we're gonna be looking at uh, this coming year. Um, play to your strengths. You've got unbelievably talented physicians. There, there are no poor physicians. Everybody's extremely good. Your provincial and national leadership is incredible. You know, telemedicine, I, I think 
is here to stay. And, and really now I would say it's about 50% of our new consults that we see virtually. And especially in cardiac surgery, once you have access to a cath and the echo and all those things, I don't think there's a whole lot that you need to do. Uh, and the basic science at Dow Med with Keith Brunt and that team continues to grow. And, and that is tremendous. So again, thank you very much, Ansar. And I think we have a bit of time for questions and, and uh, I hope that was helpful. That's great, Mark. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. And uh, obviously, as we have in, in uh, sessions past, if you want to fire anything into the chat forum, feel free. Um, I will just uh, unshare your screen um, and get you out onto the. So once again, thank you so much. And, you know, obviously, uh, if I think back to my career and, you know, fortuitous that I met you in, at McGill as a as, as my senior resident and that relationship allowed me to then uh, be hired on here as, uh, as the fourth surgeon back in 2009. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably the best thing that's ever happened. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for uh, the kind words as well. Uh, you know, we're indebted to you for having built on the foundation that was laid before you and, and you know, uh, set the path. And I think, you know, we've continued to do great things here as, you, as you've indicated. Um, I guess my question to you, and you touched a little bit upon it, which is to kind of keep the foot on the pedal, uh, you know, in, in your experience, I mean, obviously there's the, uh, the concept of building, you know, capacity, uh, you know, building technology, et cetera, but uh, anything that you would sort of advise, I mean, from a subtle perspective, because the relationships between cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, they are so different, right? I mean, that whole co concept of, you know, you know, kind of appealing to your referral base and, you know, like, any any thoughts on that on that front? Because I know when you came here, one of the first things you instituted was just that fax form that we still send off to everyone, you know, about what we did so that people knew immediately that, you know, this is, you know, this is a surgery that you had done and your patient had done and all of that. And, you know, almost trying to engage that referral base a little bit across New Brunswick and beyond. Yeah, <clears throat> I think these meetings like you're doing and you're, <clears throat> excuse me, you're having them more inclusive, I, I, I think is really key, Ansar, because communication it is, you know, everything breaks down when communication breaks down. And no matter what system that you're in, it's understanding that that's the most important thing. Because when you think about it, you know, any cardiologist in interacting with you is really interacting with you because they're trying to help their patient, right? So whether it's an American or Canadian cardiologist, they're really, you know, they have a problem and they're looking for you for your help and your expertise and your opinion in, in terms of how to solve that. So I think engaging cardiologists uh, here you know, it's, it's a little bit, it is a little bit different, uh, but I would say if anything, the, the, the communication maybe is even a little bit more like it's an expectation. We look at it, for example, at, as five points of communication. So this is one big thing that we talk with our team. So we have, every time that we have a patient referred to us, we have five points of communication with our cardiology colleagues who are really our clients in a way, right? As cardiac surgeons and how to interact with them. So we have one that when the consult is received, so to acknowledge that, to make sure that they, they know when the patient is actually seen in consultation, again, that there's a proper note and dialogue with that cardiologist of, of that patient being seen. When the patient has the, the operation, so we always call the cardiologist or text them or send them that form. Like you can never over communicate that process. Hmm. Number four is when they leave the hospital. So to make sure that they know, hey, look, your patient had surgery, he or she did well, they're on their way home. Um, and then number five is that point when you see them back and follow up to say, hey, look, everything is okay or not okay. And these are the things that we need to do. So I think if you maximize those five points of communication, every time that you have a patient and you think of it that way, it's a little bit more of a business way of thinking about it. Um, but, I, but I think it's well received. And I, I would, you know, for us, it's been very successful to do that. Uh, JF, I'll let you ask your question. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, you. you know, my question was more, yeah, yeah. Um, so you obviously in an environment where you're competing with other centers in Cleveland, but do you get a sense of the population as a whole? That's the one thing that's a bit different here is I, you know, I get a view a little bit of New Brunswick because we provide care as a single provider and we have an opportunity here to evaluate the health of the province in terms of access to, you know, blood pressure monitoring to IV drug use and advocacy in that manner. So how does the U.S. sort of system build on that advocacy and screening? And I, I'm, I'm sure they, they see also the value of that. But uh, anyways, your perspective on that. Yeah, that is where I think the American system, JF, really falls short. I, I think if when people ask me about Canadian and American healthcare systems, I do believe strongly that as a, as a human being, 
the Canadian system provides better comprehensive care, right? Everybody has or should have a primary care physician who ser serves as the quarterback for that patient. Uh, here, it's very, very different, right? That, that primary care physician may be uh, the person's urologist, right? Uh, the, the, the amount of screening. And, and that's, that bears itself when you look at neonatal mortality rates, when you look at life expectancy, which is actually dropping in the United States. And the United States rewards interventions. It rewards a lot of those programs, but it doesn't reward very well preventative care. And I think you are seeing a shift in that direction. I think with you know, the, the Biden administration, um, the left side of the Democratic Party, I think really wants to bring those types of things into place. But I think if you were to look at a system where, which is the system that can provide optimal patient care, I think the Canadian system is a lot closer to that. Where the Canadian system falls short is in terms of wait times for procedures that will improve quality of life. And I'm not just talking about heart, but to wait for six months or a year in some areas for hip replacement or a knee replacement is, is not really acceptable in terms of long-term quality of life, right? But definitely in terms of comprehensive care, um, I think the Canadian system does it much better. And you have tremendous opportunities in New Brunswick with, with that data. And one of the things that we're seeing as time goes on is that human data is incredibly valuable and, and powerful, right? So as an entity, as a provincial entity, uh, and I know you, you know, New Brunswick has done great strides in this regard, but the more that you can harness that, that data, um, that, that's a very powerful tool. So Rob, I'll let you ask the last question before I sign off. Um, thanks, Mark. That was a terrific talk, and uh, we appreciate your perspective from the states. And now two different spots. Um, my question it relates to innovation and bringing in new techniques, new devices, and you know it's always a struggle um, in the Canadian system because I guess primarily money. Do you now that you've seen how different centers innovate or bring in things? Do you, do you have any suggestions or ideas of how we can continue to prosper or foster innovation, um, be it through devices or techniques here? Uh, sorry, that's such a, a good question. Nice to see you, by the way, but I don't know if I have an answer to that. I think that, um, I think, frankly, the political system in New Brunswick or in Canada is, is a hindrance. Um, and I, I think I say that in the sense that sometimes decisions are so politically motivated um, and the understanding at the Department of Health of what we're doing in medicine is is not always what it should be at all. I mean, if you think about it, New Brunswick, and we've talked about this, has a four billion dollar healthcare budget with a health minister that every two or three or four years just changes. So imagine a four billion dollar company with a CEO that every two or three years you just haphazardly change that CEO, and maybe that CEO was like a lawyer or a teacher the week before, and now all of a sudden you're CEO of a four billion dollar entity. It's, it's not conducive to continuing along those paths. And I think, you know, for me, one of the most demoralizing things in New Brunswick was we were so close to this Tucker Park development, right? And the funding was in place. And at the time there was an election and it changed to liberal government and all those funds got shifted away to different re regions. So back to your question, I think the only thing you can do is to continue to engage government on a regular basis because they are your major shareholder. Uh, but on the other hand, I think philanthropy um, engaging you know, but also allowing government to allow philanthropy to come in to allow you to do some of, of those programs, I, I think is key. But look, uh, Saurabh, it's, it's, it's a challenge for sure. And New Brunswick's not the only place facing it. I mean, I remember the days in Ontario where the centers were, they were restricted to 50 tabbies a year. That's all they could do. You know, and that was only about three or four years ago. So it's, it's, it's not unique to New Brunswick. Thank you. Well, Mark, uh, thank you so much. As uh, Michelle wrote in the chat box, merci, Mark, uh, for a great perspective. And uh, you know, uh, uh, we're we're obviously very happy for you. And um, you know, just like you said, you know, you've got a Chilean, a Russian, and an Egyptian, which is either a great division or the beginning of an amazing joke. Uh, you know, <laughs> they're also lucky to have a, a French Canadian and a New Brunswicker on their on their on their. <laughs> On their in their department and uh, i'm sure you're doing great things there thank you for taking the time this morning and we really appreciate it and it's good to see you again thanks for the invitation and so really nice to be with you guys again hi morteza i see you there very nice to see you <laughs> hey, amy so really nice jeff thanks everybody really appreciate the opportunity you're welcome. have a good day thank you. take care bye -bye. stay safe bye-bye bye-bye